and all the people. So this morning we come here to see what God has done. And what He's done is not put together a perfect church. Because for one, no such thing exists. We are going to let down each other, one another, even as we journey together as a family of faith. I can guarantee you that there's going to be times when I disappoint you. There's going to be times, perhaps, when this church will disappoint you. But that's not our purpose. Perfection is not our purpose. But rather, during those times of disappointment, During those times of extreme hardship, when our hearts are aching, when yet another person has let us down, our prayer is here at Asbury that we find God's grace in the midst of that. And so I don't know how many times you've been let down in life. I know that I've been let down quite a bit, and no doubt I've let other people down. But in the midst of that great disappointment that we all face in life, if we'll just open our eyes, we can see God's great grace rushing right towards us. In those moments, maybe not so that we can make sense of it all, but that we can persevere through it all with great joy and great peace. Let all the peoples of the earth praise the great name of the Lord. Won't you stand this morning as we enter the courts of Jesus with praise. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and i love that old cross where the tears stand best for a world of loss in And so I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross For a crown Oh, that old rugged cross So despised by the world As a wondrous attraction for me For the dear of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my troll of 
left his glory above to pardon and sanctify me. And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my throne. Oh, for 
have the grace to trust him more. And yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus. Just from sin and self to cease and just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus Jesus how I trust Oh, and oh, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more, and give me the grace to trust him more. So sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? No, where could I go? for my soul. He did a prayer to save me in the end. Oh, where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind. I love them, everyone. We get along in sweet accord. When my soul needs manna from above, oh, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? No, oh, where could I go? Seeking refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me. Oh, where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is great with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own world. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, oh, where could I go but to the Lord? Oh, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking refuge for my soul. Needing a prayer to save me in the end. Oh, where could I go but to the to the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness. And Lord, we just humbly sit here today in the midst of your presence. And Lord, we just ask that you would speak truth to us here this morning. Illuminate areas of our lives, Lord, where we can grow in Christ's likeness. 
us, anoint me to preach this message this morning exactly as it should be preached. Lord, we give you all the thanks, glory, honor, and praise, and it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray, amen and amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. This is in the Old Testament. Uh, We'll be reading from 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, I'm sorry, it's chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, the healing of Naaman, of course, will be the title for this morning's sermon. Previously, we looked at the Tower uh, of of Babel, Uh, then of course, last week, we looked at the prodigal son. Today, the healing of Naaman, some biblical stories that uh, purport for us that the Bible is not just a sum historical document that it is actually about the right here and the right now. So we're going to read this story here, but before we do, most of you are familiar with the story of Jesus healing the ten lepers, and all ten leave, but only one return to come back to give thanks. There's only one that's grateful, only one that is appreciative. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 27, this will be the pretext text. This is the text which points to the text which I'll be preaching this morning. But Luke chapter 4, verse 27, it says this. This is after Jesus has healed the ten lepers, only one come back, right? And there were many lepers in Israel in the name or in the time of the prophet of Elisha. This is Jesus speaking, right? He's saying there's many prophets around during the time of Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So Jesus has just set up our passage for today's topic, for today's message. Jesus is saying, right, that there were a lot of people around in the time of Elisha the prophet, but there's this one character, and he is a Syrian general. He was healed during that time, right? And so this suggests, right, that people who are on the inside often feel entitled. The nine that didn't return back to thank Jesus were Israelites. The one that did return back was a Samaritan. And as we're about to discover, when God heals Naaman, there's something very, very powerful going on. This is about more than just returning with a heart of gratitude. 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Armians, one on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel. She served Naaman's wife. So Naaman is a general in Syria. They raided Israel, and he takes a young girl slave, and then she becomes a servant of Naaman's wife. The young girl says to the mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Talking about Naaman. Naaman now has leprosy. Naaman, a great general, looks in the mirror one day and he sees spots begin to form on his face. That would ultimately turn out to be leprosy, right? And so the young girl is saying, if Naaman only knew of this prophet back home, then God would heal him. So Naaman went in and told his Lord uh, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Pause. Remember, Israel is in captivity in Syria, right? And so there's false gods or other gods that are set up for worship in their temples in Syria. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, which would not be Elisha, it would be a foreign god, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. So what we have here, uh, Naaman has leprosy. Naaman, a great general of a foreign army, is struck with leprosy, and he sets out to the land of Israel to see the prophet of God to be prayed for and to be healed. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel. 
which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. This king is sensitive. Right, So Naaman comes and he appears before the king and he says, Look, I'm great Naaman. I'm a general in the Syrian army. My, uh, this young girl has said that you have a prophet here in your land, in your country, that can heal me. But the king doesn't take kindly to this. The king gets upset because Naaman had presented himself before him and asked if he could get a healing. The king says, I'm not God. Deal with it your own self. So this story is shaping up quite unexpectedly, right? Naaman, a man of great power, goes into a foreign land seeking out healing from a, a, a mystic, from God's prophet, and he's met by the king. And the king doesn't quite take too kindly to Naaman. But... When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Go and wash seven times times, but Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana, the Pafar, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And he turned and went away in rage. Naaman is from the land of the great and mighty Tigris and Euphrates. He comes to a foreign land to see a prophet of a foreign god, and the prophet of the foreign god tells him to go into the muddy water there at the Jordan River, and Naaman is insulted. How could you tell me, great Naaman, to put my head into a muddy little old podunk water bed in your hometown? So he walks away, he's upset, he's enraged, but his servants come to Naaman and they said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy. And he was clean. Naaman is getting his healing. Then he returned to the man of God. He and all his company came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. Right, so Naaman is going to give gifts to Elisha. But he said, As the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing. He urged him to accept, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings or sacrifices except to any god but except the Lord. But may the Lord pardon your servant on one account when my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my own arm, and I bow down in the house of Rimon. When I do bow down in the house of Rimon, May the Lord pardon your servant on this one count. We're going to pause right here. I'm going to recap what Naaman just said. He just got his healing. Miraculously, God just healed Naaman. He goes back and tells Elisha. And, and, and Naaman takes his entourage with him. He's got a company of probably 20 to 30 men. And he goes back to Elisha. He's all excited. He's happy. He says, I've been healed. What can I give to you? What can I show my appreciation? How can I show my appreciation? And on top of that, 
I've got a question because you know I'm from a foreign land. I'm from Syria. And we don't worship at the temple in Jerusalem or Samaria. We go over here in Syria where we worship the god Ramon. And although I know that your God of Israel has healed me, and I can look now and see my skin, it's like baby skin. Pretty neat. But I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to go back into my home country, and I'm going to walk into the temple of a foreign God, and there in the temple of that foreign God, I'm going to bow a knee, and I'm asking right now for your God, Elisha, to forgive me. Elisha said, go in peace. Naaman goes from the very top of being the most powerful general and likely the most powerful army at, in the known world at the time to being at the very bottom because he's been struck down by leprosy. And he's got to go through this process that many of us go through where we have to die out to pride, where we have to lay down our own self-sufficiency and go to extreme measures to see the face of God, to hear from heaven and to receive a healing, right? Naaman is not just some archaeological character from ancient days of history. Naaman is alive and well and reflected in many of our lives today, right? We are often brought down through the consequences and the difficulties of life to a place of humility so that we can receive what is good and worthy and loving from our Father. So Naaman is going through this process, right? He's, he, he's going through this process of, uh, 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 of humility building, right? Or humiliation. He goes to Israel, right? He brings gifts for the king. And the king, right, uh, he, he despises them. And then Naaman goes uh, to Elisha's house. And then things begin to happen, right? He receives his healing. He follows the advice of the prophet of God. He receives his healing, right? And he goes back and he tells uh, Elisha uh, about it. And, and Elisha right, says to him, after Naaman asked permission to go and worship a false god, he says, go in peace. And so we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to look at why Elisha said go in peace. There's a lot of preaching here in this one story. There's a lot of of highlights, and who knows what will surface here today, right? Uh, but we do understand and be, begin to see in this passage so something so very powerful, something that is so very enriching and fulfilling in our lives, if we'll just have eyes to see it, right? And, and so then we see that Elisha in verse 16, go back down to verse 16, right? That Elisha refused uh, the gifts, but he says, as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing, right? He will accept nothing. And then Naaman thinks ahead. He knows that the God of Israel is real. He knows that the God of Israel is powerful. He knows that the God of Israel can heal a man, right? But Naaman also knows that it is expected of him by his master, who is the king of Syria, that they are going to go into the temple of this foreign god of Ramon. Uh, and they will worship there. And then he asks for permission and Elisha says that he can go. So we see a story here where, uh, where Naaman is, is, is confronted with leprosy and then he receives his healing, right? And we see something very profound here, right? That Elisha, for some reason, right, he's telling Naaman that he can go in peace back into his foreign land, right? Because God had healed him and he's given Naaman full authority to walk into some other spaces in life, right? 
right? And, and basically what Elisha is saying right here is that God understands that God is not intimidated by this foreign God. God is not threatened or jealous of you going to this other place, right? And taking the knee or bowing the knee because God is with you, right? Uh, Elisha says that go in peace, meaning that the provision and the favor of God going with him. And this is applicable to our lives here today in this way, right? Whenever we go out into our work lives, into our community, whenever we go out and play, so to speak, whenever we travel, whenever we go to the grocery store, whenever we have to go into some unknown spaces to retrieve some people that we love very much, right? What Elisha said to Naaman is the very same thing that God would say to us here today, that I have surrounded you, filled you, and protected you with my spirit. That disease that you once had of sin has been eradicated and removed and replaced with the provision of God's precious spirit so that he goes with us when we go back out into the foreign land to save some folks, to save some people. He is with us saying, go in peace, right? Go in peace, knowing that God has got your back, right? Like the Old Testament passage says, God surrounding us, His glory keeping us from behind, leading us out front and surrounding us on all sides. So whenever you think about going into a deep, dark pit to save somebody you love very much, don't ever stop at the gate of thinking that, well, maybe I should not be here. Perhaps maybe I'm in a foreign land. Maybe I'm surrounded by people who don't believe like I believe. Maybe I'm surrounded by people who don't live like I live. But what this passage and this text would say to us here today is to go in God, with God, and God will keep you, protect you, heal you, and lift you up. So now we begin to see something here. We've not even come to the best part of the story. That's all preliminary. That's all introduction. Because look down in verse 19. I'm about out of breath, so I'm just going to recap this story for you because it goes for quite a long while. So now Naaman has went back to Elisha and he's gotten the golden ticket. He's gotten the golden seal of approval. He's got the blue check mark that he can go into any foreign land and he can do whatever, right? But he's got the seal of God on him. He's got the protection of God upon him. And so Naaman sets back out to return home to Syria, right? But we're going to jump right in. Let's look down uh, at verse 19 again. It says, But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, My master has let that Aramean Naaman off too lightly by not accepting from him what he offered. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something out of him. All right. So we have this character named Gehazi. Gehazi has spent his time right next to Elisha, right? He's a, he's a prophet in training. And Gehazi has been spending his days doing whatever young prophets in training do. I don't know, tending to the sheep, to the goats, right? Uh, writing scrolls, right? Reciting different passages from the Torah. Anyway, Gehazi sees all this go down. He sees Naaman, the great general from Syria, appear before his master Elisha. And, and he, 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 Elisha tells him what to do. And, and Naaman gets healed. And Naaman comes back a rich and powerful man man that's bringing the bounty and the loot back home to his master and he sets it, places it all around Elisha and Elisha says, I want none of it. Take it out. And Naaman takes it out. Naaman goes back home. But our boy here notices this. And he thinks to himself, my master has let Naaman off the hook. 
My master could have really uh, taken advantage of this opportunity. He had all the wealth and the riches that anybody could want that likely would have uh, matched salary for a full year, right? And, And Gehazi says that, oh man, this is not quite right because Naaman is a foreigner. Naaman is a Gentile. Naaman is not one of us. He's not an insider like you and I. He's coming from the outside and he's coming with gifts. Right, and our God has healed him, so he should pay up. He's got to pay his fair entry price to get into this group, to get into this game, right? So, this character, right, Gehazi begins to set out to chase after Naaman. How many times Have we seen God move miraculously in the lives of other people? And we felt some type of way about it, like they were getting too much for paying too little. And so what we want to do, this is what the church does. People come into church and and they've come from prostitution. They've come from suicidal ideation. They've come from the pits of hell, right? From the gates of uh, the depraved. And they've come from out of the shadows. And they come into the sanctuary, right? Men wearing dresses, women wearing pants, people wearing tattoos on their faces, right? You see people who have been pulled out of extreme challenges and hardship, then brought to the feet of Jesus. And watch what happens. There is no shame. There is no guilt. There is only forgiveness in the loving arms of God. And and perhaps we begin to, as we begin to proclaim the bold and courageous and, and mighty works of Christ in the midst, something begins to happen, right? That this divine spark that's always been there, but never been noticed, never been breathed upon, never been spoken to, right? It begins to spring forth with new life because it's the life of God that is emerging within their very being. And they come down front, for instance, and we begin to see as they pray through, God begin to break through into their lives. And then they leave, and then they uh, are in recovery, they become successful, and, and they start coming to church, right? But they still cuss a little bit. They still are a little bit wild. They have some weird ideology, right? What we often do, the mistake that many, and I'm not saying here at Asbury, I'm talking about Christianity in general, what we typically do when these people who have received the abundant and free grace of God just like we have, at some point in our lives we think that we earned God's grace. And so we look over our shoulder and we go chasing them out the door. Just like Gehazi saying, hey, you're getting off too easy. You're getting off too easy. You've not paid your dues, right? You've not been to church long enough. You've not been coming to church long enough for God to bless you. Or, hey, you've got this wrong. You didn't quite miss, you missed this spot on you, right? You've got something else that you need to do, right? So many of us are like Gehazi. We think that God is being shortchanged by God Himself because God is too good to our enemies, right? So Gehazi sets out to chase down Naaman. Point number one, we do not ever have to go and chase down people and tell them that they still owe God. His grace is free. Verse 20. I'll read it again. Gehazi says, My master, my master Elisha has let Naaman off too lightly by not accepting what he's offered. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something out of him. Elisha refused payment for the healing. Elisha said, I want none of it. He tried to give, he tried to pay his way in, right? And unfortunately, too many preachers, too many uh, pastors, too many churches will, you, they'll say, do you want a front row seat? Well, write the check out. Elisha says, I'll not play that game. You cannot buy God. You cannot buy me, right? This is the free radical gift of God, right? And so Elisha denies the gifts, but Gehazi thinks Elisha is making a mistake. 
So he goes and catches up with Naaman. Look at verse 22. So Gehazi went after Naaman and says in verse 21, and the Naaman saw someone running after him. He jumped down from his chariot to meet him and said, is everything all right? So here comes Gehazi. Naaman sees Gehazi running. Naaman jumps down from his chair and says, is it okay? Is it okay? And then uh, uh, Gehazi replies, yes, but my master has sent me to say, two members of a company of prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Naaman said, please accept two talents. Pause. Gehazi just lied. Elisha never said any of that. How many times do we put words in God's mouth and say, you have not paid your dues fully? Right here, dead in center, God is seeing all this. And in fact, we're going to find out in just a second, Elisha is seeing this in the Spirit, right? But Gehazi is lying on God. He's lying on Elisha. Naaman doesn't catch the lie. And he ends up giving him gifts, except these two talents. He urged him and tied up two changes of clothing and gave them to two of his servants who carried them in front of Gehazi. When he came to the citadel, he took the bags from them and stored them inside. He dismissed the men and they left. He went in and stood, this is verse 25, before his master and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? He answered, Your servant has not gone anywhere at all. But he said to them, Did I not go with you in spirit when someone left his chariot to meet you? Is this a time to accept money or to accept clothing, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female slaves? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he left his presence leprous, as white as snow. This is a story of a great reversal of fortunes. It's the story of Naaman being at the very top of the Tower of Power in Syria and then being struck with leprosy, the most vile, the most unsanitary disease at the time, right? This is about how at any time in our lives we're cruising right along, things are going well, but without any forewarning, right, something can land in our lap that completely reverses our world, right? That completely tosses our world upside down. And when this happens, we go into an immediate panic, right? Obviously, we're humans. We don't like change, right? But in the story here of Naaman, he would have never been brought to the true God of Israel had he never been struck with leprosy, right? And so the first point is this, anything can happen at any time, right? But when you look to God, you will always find a refuge and a resource and hope and healing for whatever ails you. That's point number one. Anything can happen at any time. Number two, this healing is given out freely. You can't purchase God. You can't purchase the gifts of God. You cannot purchase the healing of God. It is grace and grace alone pro provided and shed abroad for free. Also point number three or four, you cannot monetize God's good gifts, right? You cannot buy it, right? They are free to be received and this story is also about a prophet and God's transformative power, right? About how prophets can see in the Spirit, about how prophets uh, hear and get their directives from some other source, from heaven, from God, right? This is a story uh, about by the very end, we get to the point of the story, which is actually not about Naaman. It's not about 
about Elisha, but it's about Gehazi, and it's about you, and it's about me, right? Oftentimes when we look out into the world and see God being generous, kind, and good to people that we think do not deserve it, we are the ones that are bringing the leprosy on ourselves, right? We are the ones who trying to, to rush to uh, the aid of the man of God, trying to help God out by not letting him get in, uh, ripped off, so to speak. Like We are trying to keep measure. We are trying to keep score about who did what and who done this and who did that and who did not do that. We are playing scorekeeper in a game that requires no scorekeeper because Christ has already won. It is finished. Nobody keeps score anymore. Christ emerges victoriously, right? And so we are flowing in that very love of God when we share freely the gifts, the healing, and the good news, expecting no payment. Payment in terms of money. Payment in terms of looking like everyone else. Payment in terms of not at all being able to live in a way that Christ has made it possible for us to live. Authentically, living peacefully. And we get to watch the healing power of God at work in, in, in our lives and in the lives of many people that, are, that we're seated next to here today. We can look over and see how God has healed, how God has, has brought through time and time again, right? Where He has been faithful, right? Where He has been true, right? Where He has been there for us in every difficulty, right? We begin to see God at work and in our life, right? And then we understand something else through this powerful story as we come to a close this morning. Gehazi could not trust that God would be that good. Gehazi could not quite believe that God didn't have more stipulations for Naaman to get his healing than what he had. Gehazi thought that God had shown maybe too much compassion, too much, uh, too much grace, right, in the life of Naaman and, and, and what it has created, right? Uh, it, it's like Gehazi was an insider. He thought that he was God's right hand man or that he was Elisha's right hand man. And he's seen that maybe they were getting taken advantage of by this foreigner, right? And so then Gehazi goes and tries to play the role of that person which helps, aids, and assists God in how He handles and deals with His creation. Oh, the pride. Oh, the error that's involved in that. Friends, what we are expected to do is to have hearts like children that look out with awe and wonder. Faith like children that looks out with awe and wonder for God to bust in to the lives of many people as possible, right? And here's the thing, Gehazi thought that the healing of God was limited and it was in short supply, therefore it had to be rationed, right? But in fact, the healing of God is immeasurable and it's limitless. The transformative power of God is, 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 in restoration is available for all, right? It, it don't need to be monetized. It don't need to be rationed out, right? It, it, it's freely given. Like when Jesus healed the ten lepers, right? There's plenty of abundance. There's plenty of healing to go around. In our world today, there's plenty of healing. There's plenty of grace to go around, right? And the church should be the most generous and gracious place that we can find here in our world, right? This should, the church should be abundantly generous, right? With gifts, with, with the resources, and most of all, with the love and the grace of God, right? With the love and the grace of a kind, loving, and good Father. As Amanda and Mike come to the stage to prepare our final song this morning. As I reflected back over this story, I believe that Gehazi was scared that he wouldn't have enough.
I believe Gehazi thought that God was not quite uh, as resourceful as maybe he would need some time in the future. Gehazi thought that it was a, a quid pro quo type of setup where if you give, then you receive, right? Where if you are able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, then God will heal you. But you've got to put money in, so to speak. But what Gehazi seen there that day in ancient Israel was something that we are seeing here in our world today. All of these characters are still at play, right? There's Naaman. There's the foreign armies of, of domination and control. There's, there's the IRS, right? There's all of these systems which are a little overbearing at times. And, and we see, right, that just like Naaman, a lot of people think that they can buy the goodness and the grace of God. And so what they do, they try to measure up and to dust up and to put on a good game face and come to church. But you're buying God. That's ultimately what this story is about. It's about not being able to see the depth of God's goodness, grace, love, mercy, and healing power and thinking that we somehow have to control it. That it, it's like a river and we can't quite let it flow out to all those people because they don't quite deserve it. Whereas God says, go in peace. This morning, wherever you're at, right, wherever you are at in life, maybe you need a healing. Maybe, you, you, maybe you're like Naaman and things have been going great for you and recently you faced a setback and, and you need God to move, but you don't quite think that you've done enough to earn that, that, that forgiveness or earn that healing. And what this story tells us here this morning is of course you haven't, right? Because that's not the system that this whole thing is set up on. It's not transaction. It's relationship. Or maybe you're like Elisha and you know that God's good, loving world, right, is shed out uh, and, and filled up with His presence and that Elisha can see the goodness of God in the lives of many there that day. Or maybe this morning you're like Gehazi. You're going to save the day. You're going to get God's because He can't Himself. And for those types of perspectives this morning, I would say this. God's got it all under control. This morning, we simply sit back, worship, praise, and adore the One who which heals us all. Right? And as Naaman went down seven times, coming back up healed this morning, you and I can do the very same thing going down immersed in the Spirit of God, worshiping in prayer, and emerging healed, healthy. Won't you please stand this morning and worship Jesus. The altars are open. He'll move with you this morning. Won't you please pray? Find Jesus and worship Him. Just as I am without one but that the